a joy to, to be here. I know I talked an awful lot this morning about our son TJ. Um, we, we actually have two other uh, kids. Um, our second son, um, his name's Tyler, and um, his wife is Jenny Lee, and they've got one, uh, one boy. And they live there in Liberal. Uh, Kevin just turned 13. And uh, after serving on the staff uh, with us there for about 14 years, uh, the church voted unanimously to uh, call Tyler as uh, the next pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church, and they have, they have been at that for about three years now, and uh, just doing a great job. They really are. They're doing a, a wonderful job of, of leading and um, seeing folks saved. Um, and disciple, they've got a, just an incredible, uh, just an incredible process of um, sharing the gospel with folks. Um, they they will uh, sit down with generally one of our uh, staff for about uh, six weeks of um, just intense immersion um, in the gospel and. Um, Following that, if they uh, make profession of faith, and of course we encourage them to be baptized, and then we uh, they put them through another uh, process of discipleship, and uh, I just so appreciate the uh, the uh, um, intentional uh, effort uh, that uh, uh, Pastor Tyler and his team have uh, developed there. And as seeing folks saved and baptized uh, all throughout the year, I think there were, um, I forget what the report was uh, this year. We happened to be there on a Sunday night. I think it was 40, 44, I think, uh, professions of faith. 42 of those were baptized. And um, we're so thankful for uh, his ministry and the way God uh, is using them there. And then uh, our youngest is our daughter, Tiffany, and uh, she is spoiled. Um, I own that. Um, she was the only girl, and uh, I, she's still spoiled. She is still daddy's girl, and uh, we, uh, we just have a great relationship. Actually, they have a, uh, a connection with Atlanta. Um, our son-in-law, Kelby, uh, played professional baseball for the San Francisco Giants. And um, he made his major league debut in Atlanta um, on in August of 2015 at Turner Field, and um, let's brag on him for a minute. Went uh, three for three in the series with uh, three RBIs, and uh, quickly went downhill from there. But um, no, he he did. He had uh, enjoyed the th uh, all or parts of uh, four years uh, on the major league club with the Giants. And they just had a, a wonderful time and um, stepped away from that in uh, 2021. And uh, they have uh, settled in Liberal and uh, they own a, a uh, optical business there called Squints. And they, they, wanted to, they wanted to call it Specs, which is what his nickname was when he was with the Giants uh, because he wore glasses when he played. And uh, but that name was already taken by a company in Wichita, and they threatened to sue them if they if they use the name Specs, and so they went with Squints from Sandlot, and uh, that's where my wife works part time, and that's where I get these cool lenses and frames and uh, all of that good stuff. But uh, it's kind of kind of funny. They've got three boys. Um, Huck McCoy is the oldest. Uh, Leroy James is the is the uh, middle. And then uh, Turner Rex is, uh, is the youngest. And um, he gets Turner from uh, his dad's major league debut at Turner Field. That's where that comes from. Uh, but his brother, Huck McCoy, the oldest, is a dinosaur fanatic. And uh, in his little mind, they were talking about, you know, middle names for the baby. And in just in his way of thinking... He said, Mama, you know, if, if we named a baby Turner, then that's going to start with a T. And if we gave him a second name of Rex, then we would have our own T-Rex. <laughs> and so it's Turner Rex. And uh, he's our T-Rex. 
and uh, we uh, we just enjoy being able to to serve the Lord with our kids and uh, to see them serve the Lord and and raise our grandkids in church and raise our grandkids in the Lord and and of course Sheena uh, just a, a an incredible story of of how God brought um, another man into Sheena's life. Um, Katie and I began praying for that um, shortly after TJ's death. We just really felt like uh, those girls needed a daddy at their age, and, and Sheena needed a husband. And, and uh, so we began to pray. And it's just uh, an amazing story, it really is, of how God uh, brought Derek into Sheena's life and in the life of those girls. And um, Godly man, uh, loves the Lord. And as far as those things are concerned, he's really just picked up where T.J. left off in, in leading Sheena and those girls and the things of the Lord. And uh, he's not T.J. We, we'd never ask him to be T.J. would never expect him uh, to be T.J. He's Derek, and we love him and thankful that God has, has done that for us. Well, we were reminded again this morning as we uh, made our way to the pastor's home for lunch today that uh, grief is universal. Uh, it's everywhere. And, uh, of course, it has, has struck here. And, um, you know, guests today, uh, thank you for re- reaching out to folks and ministering to them in that way. I've often said this uh, about grief. It is something that from the outside looking in can't possibly be understood. At the same time, from the inside looking out, it's something that can't possibly be explained. I mean, really, honestly, grief is a, it's a world of its own. And that's, that's what this one writer said. He said, it's a country, really. And I'm a new immigrant inside it, and like any other country, you have to learn the laws, the rules, the physics, and it's a learning curve. And then he ended with this, so there are good days and there are bad days. And man, is he right. There are good days and there are bad days. And a good day can become a bad day at the most random times, for the most random reasons. It can be a thought. um, It can be a song. It it can be a picture. It can be a smell. It can be a piece of clothing. Um, it, it It could be somebody's laugh in a restaurant. Uh, it just, it is just a world of its own. And it, it comes, it comes on you, um, again, in, in the most, in the most random times. We'll consider the second part of the message in, in just a, a moment. But a while back, I, I began compiling a, list of suggestions for those who desire to come alongside the grieving. Some of these things are are original. They're things that, that Katie and I have talked about over the course of, of time, and, and others are things that we have picked up from others along the way. Um, if you are familiar with uh, the Grief Share Program, um, some of, of these uh, things are, are somewhat related uh, to what uh, folks would be introduced to in Grief Share. Let me just share a few of these things with you. And these, again, these are just suggestions. How do I, people want to know, well, how do I talk to somebody um, who's grieving? How do I how do I approach them? And so I'm just going to give you some things to think about um, uh, tonight. Again, I'm not an expert at this at all, so this is not coming from the, uh, from the uh, position of expertise. Um, just some, some practical things. For example, don't be afraid to talk to those who are walking through grief. 
Um, what they're going through is not contagious. Okay, you you don't have to you don't have to to stay away from them. And and understand this for those who are grieving, um, they understand that that you are are not going to fix everything and make everything okay in their life. Um, there's there are no magic words. There's no magic formula. There's nothing you can say that that's automatically going to to make them them feel better. So so don't worry about that. But I'll tell you what we do appreciate. We do appreciate your acknowledgement um, of, of our grief. Then number two, don't compare your loss to others. I uh, was in a church last year, I believe it was, and I did what I did this morning, and I was standing out in the, the foyer by, I had some of my books laying out, and I was just standing there, and this older gentleman came up to me and he put his hand on, on my shoulder and he said, well, he said, I'm going to one-up you on your grief. And I'm like, okay, I didn't know it was a competition, but, um, you know, and, and I, I just blew it off. I, he shared his story with me and, and it, was a, it was a sad story. It was a terrible story. Um, but we're, we should not be trying to compare our loss to to someone else's as much as as our loss may have hurt we should never try to minimize the hurt of others in in any way and then the third thing i would suggest is stay in touch with them the grieving process will continue long after the funeral is over and the cards have been tossed to the side, and the flowers have died and, and been tossed in the trash. And even though you have gone on with your life, as, as you should, as you should, their life is, is still in a shambles. So as you, as you think of them just randomly through the week or, or whatever, I would just encourage you to let them know via text or email or maybe a phone call uh, that you're still thinking about them and that you're still praying uh, for them. And, and especially at certain times, um, as you can imagine, certain days of the year, um, and I mentioned this this morning, are particularly hard for your grieving friends and, and family members, holidays. Uh, birthdays and, and anniversaries all reawaken those those feelings of grief. And here's what I would encourage you to do, and I have done this um, in, in all of our travels. There are just certain folks that we meet that uh, we just form a bond with for some reason, and and so we'll we'll share contact information. And I just I just put a reminder in my phone. Um, and it, 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 will, it will remind me uh, every year that this is the anniversary of their loss. And I'll just shoot them a text. I don't, I don't, it's nothing long. It's nothing uh, um, profound other than, hey, I just want you to know that, they're, that your friends in Kansas are thinking about you today. That your friends in Kansas took, took a moment to pray for you today. And uh, they, they do the same uh, for us. And it's, it's, uh, it's a blessing. So I would encourage you to do that. And then, then here's another one. Don't ask them what you can do for them. Just do it. Just do it. And I know that, that everyone means well when they say, hey, is there anything I can do for you? But I'll just be honest with you, so many times that creates more work for a person who is already exhausted with grief. The better approach, in my opinion, would be just show up with your lawnmower and your weed eater and your edger and get to work. Just show up with your shovel and your snowblower and get to work. Just call them and say, hey, I'm, 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 
I'm making a Walmart run. First of all, pray for me. And then uh, second, hey, is there anything I can pick up for you while I'm there? Um, does that make sense? J just do something. Just stop. Hey, I, I was cooking a supper for our family. I, I cooked up this uh, pot of chicken and noodles, and I, wanted to, I just wanted to bring some by. Now listen, here's the honest truth. If they want them, they'll eat them. If they don't, they'll toss them. All right? But just do something. Don't, don't tax them with um, having to come up with something that, that needs to be. Number one, they, they don't want to be a bother. They don't want to be a burden. And so they're probably not going to tell you something that really needs to be done. And so just, just show up and, and, and do it, and, and they'll appreciate it. Number five, be a good listener. Be a good listener. As you spend time with someone who's grieving, what, what you'll find is, is that every day, every day is different for them. Some days um, they may want to cry on your shoulder. Uh, and the very next day, they, they may want to vent. Uh, one day, they, they may want to sit in silence. Another day, they may want to share memories. Just being present and, and compassionately listening is such a blessing. And, and honestly, you can take your cues from the grieving person. You'll know if they want to talk. And if they want to talk, talk. If they don't want to talk, let me encourage you to do this. Don't be afraid of the silence. I know it, I know it can be awkward sometimes, but just you being there is really all they need at that moment. So, so don't feel like you've, oh man, we haven't said anything for five seconds. So I've got to interject something here. You really don't. You really don't. Just let them sit in silence and, and reflect. And if they want to say something, then, then they will. And then number six, don't judge. Everyone grieves differently. Now again, I'm not an expert. And, and if we've got experts in the room tonight, I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Um, but I know that they talk about the steps of grief. Like, well, if I can just, if I can just reach number seven, everything's going to be okay. In, in, in my experience, grief has not been one step at a time. It, ha it has been a roller coaster. It's up and then it's down and, and then you're going through this dark tunnel and it's like dark for days and you don't know if there's if you're ever going to see light again and then boom here's the here's the light and 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 you're up again and you're down again um that's okay uh we we should never uh, we should never tell a a grieving person well you know it's it's been 6 months you you ought to be no 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 we can't do that uh, th there is no set pattern of what somebody should be feeling and what somebody should be thinking at six months or even six years. Everybody is different. And I said this this morning, even, even people within the same family grieve differently. We all grieve differently. And it doesn't mean that, 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 that one way is better than the other way. Um, it, it just is what it is. And then number seven, <laughs> Don't ask, the, this, is, this is probably the, the number one question. I still find myself asking this question. Don't ask the grieving person how they're doing. Um, here's a better question. Is there anything I can pray with you about? Or, or something uh, along those lines? Because here's the deal. Depending, depending on who you are to them, you may get everything from, oh, I'm good, to just an all-out regurgitation of life stinks, I hate life, I wish I wasn't alive, 
I mean, you may get any number of things depending on who they are to you. But so many, so many times that is just a, a hard question to answer. And it's not the best question to ask. So those are just some things I'm, I'm open to. Maybe you've, you've experienced things that have helped you or things that have kind of, you know, been, eh, you know, I wish they wouldn't have said that. I wish they wouldn't have done that. And I'm more than open to, to add those to that list uh, because I, I really believe that there are good-hearted believers who want to minister to the hurting. They really do. That's their gift. They've got the gift of mercy and, and, and that's who they are, and they want to do it in the best way possible. And so those are just some things to help along the way. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 again. Let me, uh, let me reread uh, what we read this morning, beginning in verse 7. Again, Paul is, has been uh, exposed to these, um, to these revelations, these visions. Um, and then he says in verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, this thorn, he said, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. This morning we... Uh, considered three truths about walking through grief. Uh, number one, you don't have to get over it. Number two, you can get through it. And then the third truth that we talked about is that God can use pain for our good and for His glory. So let's let's pick up right there tonight with a fourth truth that I. Uh, pray will will help us get through what we'll never get over, which is this, God is sovereign. Now listen, we don't have to be, we should not be afraid of the sovereignty of God. It's a Bible doctrine. It's in there, it's, it's, it's the truth. God is sovereign. And here's, here's what that means. It means that He has the power and the wisdom and the authority to do or allow anything he chooses with regard to his creation. Let me say that again. It means that God has the power and the wisdom and the authority to do or allow anything he chooses with regard to his creation. So practically speaking, that means that he is free to do whatever he chooses to do. It means that he has the right to deal with us any way that he chooses. It means that he doesn't have to treat us like he treats our neighbors. It means that he doesn't have to treat us today like he treated us yesterday. And it means, practically speaking, and this is a big one, it means because he is sovereign, because he has the authority, the wisdom, and the power to do or allow anything he chooses with his creation, that means that he is not obligated to live up to our expectations or to explain himself. As we look back at our text, Paul knew that at some level this thorn came as Satan's attack. Now, I, I, I liken it much to, uh, to the life of Job and uh, 
uh, what God allowed uh, Satan to to do in in Job's life, and and we talked about it this morning in the Bible study time. God drew a line, and and He said, "You can you can you can, you can do this 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 and this," but it ends right there. You're not going to go any further. You cannot go any further. And so as I, I look at the life of the Apostle Paul, and, and, and I think we, we see a hint of this in, um, in the text, that, that he knew um, that at some level this was a satanic attack. The messenger of Satan to buffet me is, is how he referred to it. But he also recognized in a larger sense that, that what came into his life was only allowed to be there by God's permission. Thus the word given. Look, look at verse um, verse 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given... There was given to me this thorn in the flesh. So, so he understood that, that whatever it was, that it had, it had been given him with God's permission. It wasn't just a stroke of bad luck. It wasn't just happen chance. It wasn't just fate. What Paul was dealing with came by divine design. Now, under, understand this tonight. The truth of God's sovereignty is probably not something um, you want to address with a grieving person like right off the bat. I mean, I believe this. I've taught this. I've preached this. I believe God is sovereign. But had somebody come up to me uh, shortly after TJ's death, and said, now, Brother Prater, just remember, God is sovereign. It, it would have been like, buddy, you need to back up or I'm going to throat punch you. You know, it's like, I, don't come at me with that right now. I know all of that, but right now I'm not ready to deal with that. And so we need to be careful that we, we don't um, hit somebody. with. And, and to be honest with you, um, when I first developed this message, that was like point three, and usually that was preached on Sunday morning, and it dawned on me at some point, I don't know when it was, that, hey, Bill, that's probably Sunday morning, you got a lot of guests, that's probably not, a lot of lost people, they're not going to understand that concept. Don't be throwing that at them, you just stood there. And said what you said, and here you are throwing it at these lost people. They they don't get it. They're trying to figure out if God is, is is all that you say He is, then why did He allow this to happen? So that's why we're talking about that on Sunday night, and not on Sunday morning. Usually, those back on Sunday night are church folks and folks that 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 have some grasp of uh, of the Word of God. Um, but I do believe this tonight. That the sooner we can come to grips with these truths, the better. The, 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 the sooner we can come to grips with these truths, the better. Because tragedy will challenge everything that you have ever believed about God. Even if just for a moment, even if just for a moment, and then you snap back to reality and snap back to the truth of the Word of God. I'm telling you, just because we're human, when tragedy strikes, truths that, that you assumed and I assumed that we stood firmly on, simple, simple, simple truths like God is good and God is faithful and God cares for me. Again, if, if even but for a moment, all of a sudden, those things feel questionable. But if you have grounded your faith and belief in the Bible, though your whole world may change, the truth about God and who He is will not change. 
It will be the one thing that you can go back to time after time after time and find, excuse me, find it to be true every single time. And this, this book, the truth of this book will be your firm foundation even in the worst of storms. Listen, God was good and faithful and caring the entire 36 years, two months, and three days prior to TJ's death. And he's still those things today. What happened to our son did not change one thing about who God is. He's just the same. And I'll be honest, I don't say that tonight because I feel it. Because there are some days that I don't feel it. I know it, but I ain't feeling it. And so I, I know and you know we can't rely on our feelings. We've got to go back to the one thing that doesn't have any feelings. There's no emotion here. There's no feeling here. It doesn't waffle. It doesn't waver. It is forever the same. Amen? And so we go back to this. And, and we, we get refocused and we, we get anchored again in the Word of God. And by the way, the time to get all of this nailed down, you say, well, preacher, I mean, my life's good, everything's great, everybody's healthy, everything's fine. I get that. I get that. But I'm telling you, you need to get this nailed down right now before tragedy strikes. Trying to come to grips with, with who God is and, and, and everything that the Bible has to say about Him. Trying to come to grips with all of that in the midst of suffering would, would be like trying to build a tornado shelter in the midst of a tornado. It's too late then. It, it's, it's too crazy then. You can't, you can't do that. You have got to come to grips with these truths right now. Does that make sense? Right now. Before tragedy strikes. The fifth truth that is, is very important is that it's okay. It's okay to ask why. Some have been led to believe incorrectly in in my opinion if you're if your pastor believes differently then he's right and I'm wrong uh, but I don't think it's wrong to ask why and and honestly I think I stand on pretty good biblical ground when when I say that God is not put off by our questions I mean, go on a little Bible journey with me here. Uh, let's go back to the book of, of Psalms. The writings primarily of, of the psalmist David. And if you want a good exercise, then at some point start in Psalm 1 and just begin reading through the Psalms. And begin making a list or highlighting or underlining or starring or whatever you do in your Bible. Just begin making a list of all the times that David questioned God. Now listen, I'm not talking about blaming God. There's a difference. There's a difference. But, but mark all the times that David questioned God. I'll just give you a few. David questioned God when he seemed to be distant. David questioned God when he felt like God had forsaken him. He questioned God when he felt like God had forgotten about him. There was even a time, this is kind of humorous to me, but there was even a time when David thought that maybe God had fallen asleep. And he asked him about it. He questioned him. 
There was a time when he felt like God was hiding from him and he questioned God and he questioned God when, when he felt like injustice was, 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 uh, going to be permitted uh, to go on unpunished. And you can, you can go throughout the Psalms and, and find time after time after time where David, whom, whom later God called a man after his own heart, questioned God. Besides David, Moses questioned God in Numbers 11, as did Habakkuk in chapter 1, and Job in chapter 7, and the disciples in in John chapter 9. And if that is not enough uh, biblical evidence, then, then let's go to the end of the Gospel of Matthew and the scene of the crucifixion. And in the midst of, of the darkness that had overcome the earth at that moment, you remember Jesus cried out through the darkness, My God, my God, help me. Why hast thou forsaken me? This is God's Son questioning his father. He's not blaming. He's just questioning. And if it's okay for God the Son to ask the Father why, then don't you think it's okay for for puny little you and I who are finite in our understanding to just ask God why? Or why? I don't get it. I don't understand. A man by the name of John Kitchen said, why? is the first and greatest word of the suffering soul. Our why questions allow us to go before our Heavenly Father and and, and pour our heart out to Him. It's okay. But that being said, I'll, I'll say this tonight. I believe there is a danger in a persistent focus on why. Let me explain that. Because the longer our question goes unanswered, the more it it feeds a sense of entitlement. And as that sense of entitlement grows, it usually leads to bitterness. As you can imagine, the subject of, of bitterness is a, a message all of its own. But before I move on, I want to give you just a couple of things to consider uh, with regard to how to keep from getting bitter. Number one, accept what cannot be changed. There's not a person in here tonight who, if, if you could... Would, would, would not go back and reverse the events of February the 6th, 2018. And you don't even know us that well. But if you could go back and make everything different, you would. But you can't. We can't. Our son's gone. We, we didn't lose him. We know where he's at. But he's gone. And, 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 and you can't do anything about that, and we can't do anything about that. And the sooner, the sooner a person can come to grips with that reality, then the better off they're going to be. And then here's, here's the second one, and I think this is a big one, especially for parents with, with surviving children or for surviving family. Don't lose sight of what's left by focusing solely on what was lost. Let me say that again. Don't lose sight of what you have left by focusing so much on what you have lost. Now that's not to suggest that 
that you forget about your friend or that you forget about your loved one. Not at all. Please understand that tonight. In our, in our case, we're not, we're not moving on from TJ. We are choosing to move forward with him. We haven't left him back here in 2018. No, he's with us on, 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 on March the 11th or 10th, whatever today is, 2024. He is still with us in our hearts. We have not left him behind. Listen, we can't forget him. He's, he is everywhere around our house. I mean, my wife didn't take down his picture. She didn't, she didn't get rid of every remembrance of him. My daughter-in-law did not move one thing of his not one thing for well over a year. She didn't touch his closet. She didn't touch his hunting gear. His boots were right where they left him. His jacket was right where he left it. His bow was right where he left it. Everything was right as it was on February the 6th. So I'm, I'm not talking about moving on from... Listen, getting through... And we talked about this with, with someone this morning. Getting through is about reliving the good memories and refusing to let the painful ones drag us down. Listen, if you're here tonight and, and, and you've lost someone you love, then you understand that it is, it, it, it is but a small step between where we are right now and just absolute doom and gloom and despair. It doesn't take, it would just be a short step. But we, we have to constantly fight against letting our, our bad memories and painful memories drag us down. I think sometimes we can let our painful memories so dominate our minds and our viewpoints that our, our good memories all but disappear as they get tucked away in some dark corner of our minds. Listen, we have so many good memories of our life with our son. Sometimes we'll talk about him and we just laugh. I mean, TJ was he was the life of the party. I mean, he, he just was. He was a he was just a joker. He loved to have fun. Um and it's good to relive those times. So, so again, this is not about forgetting our son. It's about choosing not to let his death consume us. And I'll tell you why. Because we still have a daughter-in-law and three granddaughters. And our son and his wife and their son and our daughter and her husband and their three sons who need us. They do. They need, they, they, they prove that all the time. All the time. Adult kids still need mom and dad. They, they need us on a different level. I'm glad they've got their own money now. They buy their own gas now. They pay their own insurance now. But I'm telling you, I, Tyler's nearly 40 and just yesterday, just yesterday, we probably spent 30 minutes on the phone talking because he needed his dad. He needed some advice. He needed some wisdom. He needed some direction. And our daughter is the, is the same way. And the last thing, listen, the last thing that we want Tyler and Tiffany to do is to come to a place where they ever resent the death of their brother because it's stolen their mom and dad from them. It's stolen their Grammy and Papa from their kids. And we are very intentional about this because we don't ever want that to happen. Ever. And so it, it's, it's important that, that we remember that, allowing ourselves to become so consumed 
by our grief is going to rob them and others in our lives of the love and affection and attention that they need and, and quite honestly deserve. And then here, here's the final thing that, that I'll share with you, and it's certainly not the least by all means, but it's simply this, God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. The pain of, of losing our son was greater than anything I can even begin to describe. But the help that we have received from the Lord is greater than I could even begin to explain. Again, we had this conversation with someone this morning. How do lost people deal with life? I mean, seriously. How do they deal with life? I am so thankful for God's grace. When Paul said, my grace is sufficient for thee, that's exactly what he said because he had experienced it. And I love the word sufficient. It means enough. That's what it means. God said to Paul, Paul, my grace is going to be enough for you. You're going to be okay. You're going to go on and you're going to do great things for me because of my grace. It is always and forever enough. It would be easier to dip a, a sponge into the Atlantic or the Pacific and soak up all of the water than it would be to supply God's, uh, uh, to, to diminish God's supply of grace. It would be easier for you to step out your front door in the morning and suck all of the oxygen out of the atmosphere with a straw than it would be to exhaust God's supply of grace. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. When John Newton penned this promise, he did so out of personal experience. His, perhaps his greatest test came the day that he buried his wife, Mary. He loved her dearly and had prayed many times that his death would precede hers, but his prayer was not answered. On the day that Mary Newton died, John Newton found strength to preach a Sunday sermon. The next day he visited church members and later he officiated at his wife's funeral. Yes, he grieved. But in his grief, he found God's provision. People say, Brother Fred, I don't know how you get up in front of people and do this so many times, week after week after week. And, and, and the only answer I have, and it, it's not a bunch of preachers speak. It's God's honest truth. It's his grace. That's it. It's his grace. I can't explain it. I don't get it. When I mean, you saw me this morning, I, I lost it for a moment there this morning. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not. I'm not ashamed of that at all. I'm just telling you that, that, that we, we share our hearts with, with others as you, some of you, share your story and your hearts with others only because of God's grace. That's it. John Newton would later write, the Bank of England is too poor to compensate for such a loss as mine. But the Lord, the all-sufficient God, speaks, and it is done. Let those who know Him and trust Him be of good courage. He can give them strength according to their day. He can increase their strength as their trials increase. And what he can do 
He has promised that He will do. Thank God tonight for His all-sufficient, absolutely amazing grace. Many have attempted to define grace. I have always liked this particular definition. God's, God's grace is His supply for my every need when I need it. Let me say that again. God, grace is God's supply for my every need when I need it. Peter writes of the, the manifold grace of God. The word manifold there meaning varied. Just as there are a variety of medicines to, to treat a variety of illnesses and just as there are a variety of tools to accomplish a variety of projects. You've got a tool for this and a tool for that and a medicine for this and a medicine for that. There are also varied facets of God's grace to minister to the various needs that arise in our lives as believers. Please don't ask me to explain all of that. I can't. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. That God's grace is varied. That, that it's multifaceted. There's grace for saving and there's grace for serving and there's grace for suffering and there's grace for this and there's grace for that. And, and I know there, there may be some who would say, well, preacher, I've heard that for years. Preacher's always talking about God's grace. And here you are. You're standing up there and talking about how God's grace got you through this. And, 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 and others talk about how grace has done this and grace has done that. But, but how do you tap into that grace? I mean, how do I... How do I avail myself of, of that grace? How can I get in on that? And I think the Bible, the Bible tells us very clearly in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Listen, God's throne is characterized as a throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy, the writer said, and, listen, and find grace in time of need. So here's how we avail ourselves. Here's how we tap into God's grace. We go to Him in prayer and ask Him for it. it it's, it's no more profound than that. We get on our knees and we say, God, I cannot do this today. God, I, I cannot face this day. God, I, 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 I cannot, I cannot take another step. I have got to have your grace and your help. God, I, I don't, it's not that I can't, it's that I don't want to live another day. I don't. I need your grace. God, I cannot cope with another memory. I cannot have another day like I had yesterday. I'm going to have to have your grace. And you know what God promises to do? He promises to give us grace in our time of need. And before we know it, we've reached the end of another day. We've made it to another lunch hour. And now we go back to that same throne, to that same God, 
Say, God, I made it half a day. Lord, if I'm going to make it this afternoon, you, you got to help me again. You say, well, well, what if I keep asking for God's grace? He's going to keep giving you grace. Because you can't exhaust His grace. It's sufficient. It's enough. I'll leave you with this quote from a man by the name of Ken Sandy. It's a book that I've been reading. He said, trusting God does not mean that we will never have questions, doubts, or fears. We cannot simply turn off the natural thoughts and feelings that arise when we face difficult circumstances. Trusting God means that in spite of our questions, doubts, and fears, we draw on His grace and continue to believe that He is loving, that He is in control, and that He is always working for our good. Such trust helps us to continue doing what is good and right, even in difficult circumstances. That's what it means to trust God. To believe that He is always good and right. That He's always working for our good and for what is best for us, even in the most difficult circumstances. If you believe God's Word tonight, say Amen.